hi everyone. I think we can start. So my name is Eleonora. I'm the co-lead of the Global Cash and Child Protection SAS Force, which is under the Alliance for Child Protection in Humanitarian Action. And so the Alliance and the Task Force are pleased to invite you to this webinar to present street child work on integrating cash and child protection outcomes. Street Child is a child center organization that specializes in integrating solutions to education and protection for children in chronically poor or conflict and crisis affecting contexts. In recognition of the complex and compounding barriers that children and families face, the organization operates an innovative model that combines cash and social support to sustain the child's cognitive development and well-being. We have with us the speakers who are Marcello Viola, who has nine years experience in working with and for marginalized and vulnerable children, started as a social worker with adolescent asylum seekers and migrants, and is now the program director of Street Child for Nigeria and Mozambique. And then we have also Mohamed Turai, who has nine years of experience in business development, uh, sustainable livelihood scheme and project management. He started working uh, for Street Child, establishing opportunities as a unit manager. So I think I will leave the floor to Mohamed and Marcello to start the presentation. Thank you very much, Eleanor, and uh, also thank you to the Alliance for such opportunity to present some of the the work done related to the to the subject of uh, this presentation. So, as you correctly mentioned, Street Child is is a child center organization, and our experience with cash intervention is more related to income driven activities. So, our ultimate objective is the child development and well being ensuring that all children can access a meaningful education and can be safe and protected when they are at home with their parents in school or within the wider community. The integration of education and child protection or even the mainstreaming of child protection depending on the opportunities and the, on the context is then the, the foundation of uh, our intervention in, uh, in both development and uh, emergency context. And livelihood is a strategic component that is relevant to ensure that families can continue caring for, for their children. I want to begin with a, a preamble uh, because you will hear in this presentation how our cash intervention started targeting out of school children, while here we are presenting results against child protection outcome. Results obtained in education can benefit the child also with the child protection lens and vice versa. Especially in emergency, Education is a child protection strategy, is a, is a service that uh, must be provided and considered when develop a child care plan. So being school reduce the child protection risk, reduce the likelihood to be involved in child labor, reduce the likelihood to be involved in early marriage or to be victim of violence or exploitation. Uh, and it's also a result uh, of redu uh, reduced neglect from, from parents. So it's, it's also very key to consider the impact on the social emotional component of the child and the opportunity for the child to learn life-saving skill when in an education emergency. So making sure that the child is back to school and safe when in school is already a strong achievement from, from the child protection perspective. And this is the lens we are going to use on our uh, presentation. There are also other components that contribute to the child development and well-being that we need to take in consideration when designing uh, our integrated programs. We start from, from the child and then the family, and then we reach the wider community and the school when, when planning our implementation. So helping caregivers develop a more sustainable source of income is a key step. And the increased income provide the caregiver with the capacity to shoulder parental responsibilities. The economic improvement can be tied to have behavior change, um, such as stopping child labor or, or child marriage, uh, although it doesn't need to be strictly conditional, as we will see uh, later, but might also be soft conditional. And this, I think, can also be a child protection entry point in a standalone cash intervention. Working with parents and, and caregivers gave us the, the chance to promote positive parenting that can also help in reducing the, the tension and the violence inside the household. 
consider that often the violence and GBV incidents are perpetrated within the household. I think that we also budget for cash intervention to specifically consider support family reunification or alternative care, or also the socioeconomic reintegration of children associated with armed group or armed force, while also considering other services um, for, for case management. And finally, as I said before, like either it is internal or external, it is important to identify opportunity to ensure that children are accessing education and psychosocial support and, uh, and work with school and teacher to build uh, a child-friendly and protective uh, environment. So now I'm going to give the floor to my colleague, uh, Mohamed from Sierra Leone, who is going to give more details of our cash model called the Family Business Scheme. Over to you, Mohamed. Thank you very much, Marcelo. I am Mohamed. I'm working for Street Child Sierra as a project manager and I would like to present to you the Street Child Family Business Scheme that has supported thousands of families in Sierra Leone and across Africa as a cash risk transfer for education project. I would like us to look at key elements of our scheme that are embedded in this presentation. The scheme itself is unique because it's a cash risk transfer for education programs and also it has some soft components like monitoring, mentoring, and some savings schemes. It's scalable and can represent value for money for a sustainable livelihood project. The scheme has also been recognized for its effectiveness in the area of child retention in school and primarily addresses barriers to education, to access education. And most importantly, it creates a reliable source of income for vulnerable homes. Also, it has been able to create a space for inclusion of additional children, which we call siblings, into the project for support to, to create more impact. The scheme can be monitored across all levels of implementation because of its adaptive nature. Over the years, uh, many sister countries are now implementing the scheme into the livelihood project because it can be easily replicated. And these are the key elements of the scheme. It's unique, it's effective, it's adaptable, and it can be easily replicated. We'll have to look at the steps involved in setting up the FDS scheme. First of all, what we do, we need to identify the rightful beneficiaries that need to be supported in each of our programs. So identification is first. We identify these children, and the identification is being done by our social workers who are in constant touch with the children in the street. Uh, after the identification is done, a business plan will be developed with the caregiver. This has to do with which type of business the caregiver plans to do when the grant will be dispersed. After the development of the, of the business plan is concluded, we will now train the caregivers on basic business skills like customer relationship, numeracy, and some literacy uh, skills, record keeping because we are dealing with the most vulnerable. Some of these haven't got to school. That is the reason why we, we, are, we are training them on the basic numeracy and literacy skills. This will be followed by grant disbursement. After the training, we can now disburse the grant because we are confident that they can, they can be able to effectively and efficiently manage the grant and then they can start the business. After we have disbursed the grant, we, we will now monitor them that comes into how, we, how effective the scheme is in terms of its savings ability. We will we'll then collect savings based on the agreed time frame set up for the savings scheme. So this is in effect the necessary steps that we will take to set up the FBS scheme. Over the years, uh, the scheme is so important that it has provided a reliable source of income for the most vulnerable household by empowering extremely poor households. We all know one of the fundamental reasons of the, the excessive school dropout rate is as a result of poverty. So uh, the FBS schemes literally address this area because by empowering the family, the caregiver, you also support the child in school. It also improves the family ability to retain the child in school with the revenue generated from the business. This is a win-win situation for the family and the child as well. The family is being empowered with a business and the child is being taken care of from the proceeds from the business. On average, the grant will benefit two children per household. That means the base can benefit 
and another extra children within the family can also benefit from the proceeds uh, raised to the business. And it's also providing an efficiency and value for money because uh, it's the impact has been replicated from just one beneficiary to numbers of vulnerable children within the household. It's also helped vulnerable families uh, to promote the habit of savings. We know how it's difficult for families to save. So this scheme also helped family to, to, to inculcate the habits of savings. And finally, uh, my last slides, we'll, we'll be looking at the selection criteria. We have four selection criteria, four, five, five selection criteria that we'll be looking at. The child status, the family source of income, the household head, the breadwinner, and also the number of vulnerable children in the household. For the child status, initially we start working with out of school children, and we have included all the vulnerable groups like the separated child, the children with disability, unaccompanied child, early marriages, teen, teen pregnancies, children affected by armed groups, and child labor. We will look at this, uh, the status of this child, and then these are criteria that we'll be looking at, but the business officers can look at and, uh, and assess the beneficiary for them to be part of the project. And also for the area of the family source of income, we also look at the current living situation of the family, whether they are doing vocational business like soap making, if they are into farming, if they're into petty trading, or they're just beginning or they're into nothing at all, absolutely. And if they're into nothing at all, that gives us the, 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 the ultimate advantage to see the real impact of the project because from our intervention and through our monitoring, our, our sophisticated monitoring system, our monitoring and processes, we'll be able to see how far we've taken the family from where they are, where they, are, where they were before, and where they are at the end of the project. And that will see the real impact of the, of the scheme. And also, that has to do with the head in the family. We, we, are, we are paying premium concern to a family, to a child-headed household, for example, a family-headed household. And also, uh, if, the, if, if the caregiver is, is so old, so sick, that can't be able to fend or to take care of the children, these are also criteria that we'll be looking to for us to create the convincing factors for the child to be supported in the scheme. And lastly, the number of the vulnerable children also is very important. As Alan mentioned, the base is just our focus, primary focus, but the project also takes into consideration all the vulnerable children into the, in, in the, within the household to create more impact. For example, household like two to three, um, four to seven, and eight and above beyond. The larger the size of the household, the more vulnerable the household can be. Thank you very much for, for allowing me taking you through the this presentation on a child protection and cash intervention. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mohamed. I would like to, throw, uh, to take us through, through the journey, who basically took us to start using this, this model in 2008 for 3,000 family until uh, uh, just recently also in Uganda in a refugee contest. And this was possible by bridging humanitarian and development approaches that using the, the learning from one contest and adapt uh, and replicate to others. So the, I think that the Ebola outbreak in 2014 represented a turn uh, for, for, for us to start reflecting beyond the education aspect by also exploring the linkages between child protection and uh, economic vulnerability. And, uh, and this is when we start also to, to support uh, unaccompanied children as a, as a result of Ebola. During that year, I had the opportunity to work with Mohamed and uh, we support uh, about 12,000 caregivers with benefit for 24,000 children. In 2017 is when we start to using this in, uh, in uh, our Nigerian response, where I'm presently am. And uh, the results prove that cash programming can be leveraged early in humanitarian response to support the family resilience. In Nigeria, our primary target are the unaccompanied children and the children associated with the armed group. We also consider vulnerable households among uh, IDPs to basically work more on the prevention of child protection uh, risk. But let's go more into the, the details and bring some, some evidence of uh, what we are saying. And today we are going to present, to compare some results from two interventions that come from a different project with some similarity and some differences, mainly because different is also the area of interest of the donor. So we have and violence against children, who is mainly a child protection intervention with all the main component. Education wasn't budgeted, but uh, we proposed to implement in specific area where we already had education intervention. So we had the opportunity for, for internal referral and 500 caregivers of 
and accompany children and CAG and children with a mental health and psychosocial issue were referred from caseworker to access the cash. While WFP project was mainly a food security and livelihood intervention and the level of integration was a bit more difficult, let's say, because um, the location we were asked to work uh, in by the donor. But at some level, we were able to consider uh, some activity like case management and NHPSS through external referrals. So the Northeast Nigeria has a uh, humanitarian response with uh, many other actors. And uh, when possible, we also integrate positive parenting and uh, child protection advocacy, uh, who was mainstreamed through the support from uh, some other staff from uh, other program. And we supported 700 households among uh, um, host, IDP in host community and IDP camp based on a balance between our own selection criteria that uh, Mohamed presented and uh, the donor uh, selection criteria. In our logical framework, there are different indicators we measure at baseline and line outcome level in addition to the um, project specific output. We consider uh, indicators like food consumption, the capacity to, to save and diversify the family expenditure, but most important, the child well-being. Child well-being is mainly self-reported by children. So of course it brings some, some limitation in, in the finding, but in general it is triangulated with uh, observation and uh, some focus group discussion with, uh, uh, with parents. Uh, for child well-being, the key aspect we, we go to investigate uh, with the child is about their physical well-being, the emotional well-being and the self-esteem, and also the relationship they have within the family and their parents, with their friends and uh, with the community members, and also their feeling and relationship uh, in school with, uh, with the, their classmates and with teachers and the, um, the interest in, in going to school. What we would like to start to measuring next, um, and we are working on it, is to reduce also the reduced child protection risk as a child labor or early marriage. So it will also be good to hear maybe at the end of the presentation who has used some smart indicator for that. So, so let's start to, to look at some of the finding and um, um, the result. The first result is related to the caregiver capacity of saving. Here we see the great achievement obtained within the WFP intervention. From 11% of beneficiaries reporting to be able to save at baseline, we had 98 of them able to save at end line. And even more, the save sites increase concurrently with the distribution of food. So also the importance of adding additional, additional support for higher impact. Similar results were, were also seen in uh, the EVAC project with the percentage that was reduced to 85%, um, probably due to lo the location of the implementations. With some of the beneficiaries who were living in uh, some hard to reach area with uh, low accessibility and so also less market opportunities. School enrollment provided also the most interesting result for us. Both interventions saw an increase. With WFP project, you can see here seeing a reduced difference between baseline and the line due to the fact I mentioned before that the selection criteria were balanced between uh, us and the donor and also the reduced opportunity to provide uh, or refer to education services. They increased from 48% to 97% in, uh, in school enrollment attendance, support the existing literature that economic improvement correlates the positive behavior change. Interesting, the likelihood of the birth children attending school within the household was higher at baseline then the school enrollment of additional children as those who were accompanied and uh, living within the household. This was seen before also in other places and indicated that when the finances are tighter, the family prioritized their own children basically. But at the end uh, of the intervention on both projects, there was uh, no significant difference between the two groups. So the educational chances of unaccompanied children became equal to the children by birth as the family income improved. Important for the health and the nutrition status of the child is ensuring that there is a positive impact on the number of meals that the child is able to, to have during the day. In, in EVAC, by the end of the project, over 90% of families were able to eat three times a day, uh, whereas 20% had only been eating once a day at the start of the project. And this can be seen also in the, in the WFP project. So at the end line, 82% of beneficiaries could feed their household three times in a day. 
And here, the impact was even more interesting in the, in the IDP camp against those living in host community, where at baseline, more than three quarters of beneficiary family ate only one meal a day. And uh, after the intervention, all beneficiary families reach um, eat at least two meals a day. Of course, we also consider that in a, there is a higher presence of more actors uh, in the IDP GANs providing different services that can contribute to, to this success. In terms of child well-being, uh, the results are also interesting. Reaching the, the children with the activity in the child-friendly space and providing mental health psychosocial support was very key for this success. So over the course of the project, the percentage of children who reported that they never felt strong and full of energy fell from 100%, so the total pool of monitored children, to 5%. While those feeling strong increased from 0% to 59%. I think this is really strong finding. And the same trend was, uh, was found in, uh, in, uh, in WFP, where with the percentage of children that were reporting they, feel they fell ill often uh, reduced from 71% to 5%. So for both interventions, the overall decrease in children feeling ill could be related to the increased ability of families to, to feed themselves, as we saw before. And also have a, having an increased capacity to save money might also have helped to, to avoid um, shock or provide health care during period of illness, as we will see in the, uh, in the next slide. In fact, there are also other interesting findings that is worth to, to share here for the purpose of this presentation. One is in terms of the household capacity to diversify the expenditure. In EVAC, uh, over the course of the project, the number of households prioritizing spending on education increased from 6 to 22%. This result comes with the importance of advocacy with the household to, to promote the value for, for education. And it's also true that there are other interventions to provide free education, uh, either formal or non-formal in, in the Northeast Nigeria. It's important also to, to invest in, in advocacy with the household and the community to promote the, the, the value for, for education. And also we notice an increase in, uh, in medical expenses, as I was saying before, from 11 to 18%. So uh, although it's, it's a minimal, we also need to understand the, the context. And this is, is something, you know, that move uh, towards uh, have an impact on the child development and, and, and well-being. And um, finally, on WFP, we, we improve our assessment tool. This project was done late in second half of 2019. And um, we went to look at the, the relationship between uh, children and uh, their parents or the caregiver. So there is a general increase in the number of children that report to get on well with their parents a lot of time through, throughout this project. And this could be the result of the uh, knowledge gain on positive parenting skills that, um, that we mainstream in, in some of our uh, initial business training. And I think this can be also useful uh, evidence to support the, the, the theory of the, uh, create opportunity to reduce household tension and violence, uh, for instance. So besides the, the figures and the number, of course, it's also important to listen the voice of the, the children and the adults uh, benefiting from this intervention. And this confirmed what we, we measured, we also presented now. Some interesting quotes taken during the final evaluation from parents who expressed how they had seen behavior change in their children and that caregiver-child relations had been improved. Caregiver of children associated with group reported that relationship between the children and the other from host community improved significantly as a result of interaction at the child-friendly space. And this was also confirmed from the, from the children's side, from the children associated with group who expressed as in the past they had found it difficult to connect with children who had no experience experiencing the conflict as they had. And finally, I think also the, it was interesting to hear from the members of the project management committee, uh, who were community members, representative, selected to support the implementation of WFP uh, project and reported to have noticed an increased confidence in the parents who can now afford for some of the child needs and requests. So, we are at the end. Uh, we presented what we think are the strengths of this, of this approach, but I'm also very open to hear from uh, others about their experience who could, uh, who could improve this approach, who could uh, 
identify some of, some of the limitation of the, the, the application. But I also want to briefly add the opportunity that this intervention gave us uh, during COVID-19, uh, as, the, as the picture uh, below show. We involved existing beneficiaries who went through uh, soap making and tailoring training um, as an area of interest for, uh, for their business uh, to support them in producing liquid soap and reusable face mask. This is a great opportunity to, to, to make sure that they continue making an income despite the market restrictions and while also support the, the wider community, including the international community, to have access to the protection and preventive equipment that in this period are quite scarce or expensive. Finally, this is the last, I promise, talking about sustainability. Cash transfer program sometimes pose a, poses a challenge. You can obtain positive gains, but there are no maybe many evidence that these are sustained after the, the intervention. Uh, we conduct a review in Sierra Leone two years after Ebola, and, uh, and uh, the, the evidence showed that 87% of children supported were retained in school compared to 55% with no support in our control group. And also 77% of businesses were still operational. Come true, and uh, we'll be happy to not only receive questions, but also really uh, ask participants how can uh, improve and uh, contribute to, to create more, more evidence for, for the sector on how the cash intervention can obtain child protection uh, outcome. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Marcello and Mohamed. A very interesting presentation. There are already lots of questions. So since we are in times of COVID, one question was around, can you, if you can explain a bit what are the, how did you adapt these models during these times and given the restriction that we have currently? Yeah, so all our case worker and, uh, and uh, PSS facilitator, they, they went through um, kind of refresher training or an orientation uh, around uh, the COVID-19 uh, factor and uh, how to prevent it so that they could uh, take this knowledge uh, down to, to parents and, and children. During, during the, that period, like, uh, we didn't have any existing training for, for, for the family business scheme, but uh, we, we continue to monitor some of, the, some of the businesses. Of course, as I say, when there was the total lockdown, somehow, some of the, depending on the business, some of the parents were, um, were constrained. But consider also in Borno State that the lockdown didn't last uh, too long. And as I say, we, we find an, an opportunity to, to also make a good use of, of this period, as I mentioned, for, for the liquid soap and the FPS. For, in terms of case management and, uh, and uh, child-friendly space, of course, we, we suspended initially some, uh, some of the activity to just prepare um, our staff and, uh, and our partner staff, because we work through, through local partner, to, to, to learn about this new way of working. And uh, after, I think about two or three weeks, then we, we start to have some, some activity, especially for mental health and PSS. We, we are doing remotely um, with, uh, with some key messages around, like child-friendly messages around COVID-19. Uh, COVID As I say, market accessibility in terms of continuing to have sustainability and, and create opportunity for, for families, that, you know, that, that's what we think can, can have an impact on the, the child well-being. Could, could be a threat. If there's no market, there's no, there's no income. But it's also true that uh, like multi-purpose cash intervention who provide red cash on a monthly basis might also require uh, access to services for, for, for parents. Thank you, Marcello. Hi, Nora. This is Stefan. I'm a cash technical advisor with the, with the IRC. And I, yeah, I already asked a question in the chat, which is um, that we on our side have seen uh, in a few projects um, throughout the world uh, the risk that parents intentionally um, abuse or malnourish, uh, so basically withhold food from, from their children, to be in, enrolled into a cash uh, or voucher um, program. And so my question is here if anyone else has, has seen that too, and if anyone has already thought about um, or tested even effective mitigation measures against that. We have, or we're in the process of doing that, but we're we're also aware of the fact that it's something that we haven't done. As I also noted in the, in the threats is the, the counter effect, no? like uh, for, for instance, one of his incentive for, for child labor. 
as my colleague uh, Mohamed was was mentioning, I think one one important aspect of this this model is the is the regular monitoring and mentoring of the caregiver. So as soon as the business uh, is over, and uh, and we provide cash from the, the the day after, basically we go on a weekly basis to to be, to, to monitor their their business, to visit their their household through through a, a network of livelihood caseworker. And um, of course, sometimes, you know, we, we, we might have met some the family where the child was supporting the, the parents in doing the, and then doing the, the, their business. So of course, you really require continuous monitoring. It, this is why I think it has some strength against the, the, the cash intervention only, because you maintain a constant relationship with us, so it's easier to identify the risk and also the selection of the, first of all, the way it is, it is um, promoted or introduced to, to the community is important to avoid, you know, to do more harm. And um, we try also to, to balance, for example, when we work with um, unaccompanied children or children associated with armed group, um, we balance the kind of the, the, the beneficiary groups. So we try not to 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 sell as a as a as support for for the accompanied children or, or the CAG, but really um, that's that's why we also involve like uh, vulnerable household uh, only to to prevent some of some of the risks, so that this could could reduce the appetite for for families to to maybe separate with their children or as you say um, perpetrate violence within within the household. Yeah, so I think it's 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 um, it's uh, it's the way. And when I talk about business and and children uh, um, supporting the, the the caregiver in their business, it's also important um, the selection of the of the beneficiary. So to ensure that the the, the beneficiary is able to to run the business with the uh, with their strength, with their with their time. So to not rely on uh, uh, younger energy, let's say. Thanks, Marcello. And uh, maybe we can uh, read some of the questions in the chat box as well. So there was a question from Emmanuel, if there is any evidence that the savings scheme can gradually offset cash transfers for family. Uh, and also there is a question from Stefano on uh, which methods have you been using to collect children opinion? Yes, it, 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 it's evidence-based. Over the years, we've seen family uh, graduated from savings into owning their own existing business and at the same time supporting the child in school. So yes, it's an incremental thing that can actually offset cash intervention in the near future because uh, we ensure that we are not only monitoring the, the business, but we're also mentoring these caregivers, give them valuable advice as to how to, to manage the business extremely and how to also manage the cash, and also how to ensure that they are able to save, because saving is essential to the scheme. Uh, for as long as they've inculcated the habit of savings, as they go deeper into the project, or after even they've been exited from the project, they, are, they, are, they, they can be in, in, a, in, in a much more better position to be able to continue, even without further cash interventions over the years. So yes, I, can, I do totally agree that the saving schemes in the future can, can, can offset cash transfers to vulnerable homes. Yeah, and if I can add to that, I don't know if it was clear from, from the beginning, this model is just, there's only one distribution of cash at the beginning, and then it's a mainly saving collection and uh, distribution again of the saving at the end. So it's not a continuous, uh, there's no continuous cash injection uh, to the family. And as I say, like we, we did this uh, sustainability review in, in Sierra Leone over two years, where we saw that 75% of businesses were was, was still uh, operational. So I think, I, think, I think there are enough evidence um, for this. In terms of how we collect children um, input, like uh, first of all, we, we targeted adolescents. So um, we, we had this focus group discussion with, uh, with children between the age of 11 and 15 in, in group with, uh, with open questions. So we had uh, a set of, of simple questions to, to make it easier. Of course, in, a, in other contexts also, when we, especially when we work with younger children, we're trying to have tools that they require also a, a, an engage, a different level of engagement of children by stimulating them with uh, some, some activities. In terms of well-being, like, as I say, is a self-reported tool that 
with with simple questions like terms of how often do you, do you, do you feel uh, ill uh, how what is the relationship with with your children it, it's very basic but um we're also working uh, since there is a colleague from irc we're also working on uh, how to integrate the serice tool that i find very very interesting to to measure the the well-being and the social emotional uh, learning of, of the children so i think uh, more than uh, more than self-report in that case is more like situational uh, basis thank you thanks marcello there are a couple of questions on one is on children associated with armed conflict or armed forces like so how how did you manage their integration and and the stigmatization from the community and then there is another question on how did you manage cases of heads of household so we started targeting children associated with armed group and supporting the, the caregiver of the family where um, they were going back. So after they, they, they moved from the transitional center, going back to the family, we, we, we work with the, with the caregiver basically to, first of all, ensure that, especially if it's a, a um, intentional join of the of the, the armed forces often is, is because there are like um, some condition that's all that that bring the, the, the person to, to want to, to move out and join the, the forces. So uh, we try to tackle the, 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 the economic barrier. And and also I think as I say this can also create some level of positive interaction between uh, the child and, and, and the caregiver. So as I say, it's also, it, it's not just the, the family business kit, but it's, it's coming with a, with a package. It's coming with a package of awareness and, uh, and positive parenting. Recently, we also start to, every contest is different, so we also need to, to adapt and, and, and change. Initially, we never provide family business kit support to to minors, but um, with a uh, with, um, CAG between the age of 16, 18 in the Northeast Nigeria, uh, look at the, at the contest, we start to, to involve them, to provide some, some vocational, uh, vocational skill and, uh, and uh, a startup kit, um, integrated with, uh, with um, opportunity for, for basic education. So for those who are not interested or, or are not fam- uh, very comfortable to go back to uh, either formal or non-formal school, we have to find uh, alternative solutions. So either identify vocational centers or for us to, to, to assign them to, to a master and, and then provide also basic um, education. This model, when it started, when we look at the child head of the household, we make sure that we identify the, the person, the, the, the person that is in the best position to support the child. So it's not given to the support is not going to the child to, to establish his own business, but there is a, the caseworker work on uh, identify like uh, uh, an alternative care or some some relative within the extended family who will take charge of the, the child responsibility, and uh, we invest on them for the for the for the family business team. Thanks, Marcello. So there is another question on how long the cash transfer was provided for and in terms of education if it covers the child primary and secondary levels and if not how can we ensure that the child remains in school when the program ends and i think there was a question also to ask if the two models the two donors that you mentioned were the same in terms of transfer and duration i can answer both so in terms of how long it takes usually the model, when started, look at um, going into a, a period of 20 weeks of saving. So over, over five months, we had a, a weekly collection of, of the saving and, uh, and the coaching and mentoring of the, of the beneficiaries, the monitoring. And then at the end of the 20 weeks, we, we, we give back the, the saving where it's possible also adding an additional matching grant so that the, they could reinvest in busting the, their business. Uh, what we are doing now also in terms of sustainability is, um, is, uh, is to, to learn from the informal uh, saving group that we, uh, we have in, in Sierra Leone, in, in, in Nigeria, that are called differently and are very similar to the DSLA model. So we are now also making sure that at the beginning, um, we don't invest only on the, on the family business scheme, but we also work to, to, to promote the saving uh, loan association.
Um, so this is this is one. And uh, of course, in emergency in emergency situation, like we need to be flexible. Like in Sierra Leone, in development, of course, we had different cycle of of beneficiaries within the five six months. Here in Nigeria, for instance, often we had initial grants for working for, for six months and of course time to, to, to set up and identify uh, beneficiaries take already some, some of the time. So we had to flexibly uh, decide what would have been the, the period of, of saving. So we also did for 12 weeks, for instance, instead of, of 20. So flexibility is, uh, is important. Of course, the, the results are similar, but uh, the, longer, the longer the better. In terms of education, also they depend on the on the on the contest we are. If we talk about uh, Sierra Leone, we and uh, when it was used also for the for the back to school after after Ebola outbreak, of course, first of all, we try to we, we work on mainstreaming the children to the into back to the formal system. So it was either the the, the primary or secondary education. Whereas in in Nigeria, uh, with the project that we just presented. We, we are working mainly in, in the, in the non-formal uh, sector. So we provide temporary learning spaces and our primary objective is to look at the basic education, uh, basic literacy and, and numeracy. So it, it really depends on, on the age of the child and the, and the family, family status. But consider that in Nigeria, over 10 million of children never been in school. It's very easily to identify children who uh, had never been in school. So we, we basically provide them opportunity to go into our temporary center. But it's also true, we had some, some, some beneficiaries who were uh, at the age and had the, the, the education foundation, the literacy foundation that could help us to just refer them to, to formal school, public school that were available. So bring back them to formal education. In terms of the duration of the, the project, um, the end violence against children was with a no-cost extension went through eight months of implementation, while uh, the WFP we just presented was initially, even there is seven months officially with, uh, with two months no-cost extension, so yeah, nine months. The, the duration has been uh, uh, very, very similar. Thanks, Marcello. Okay, this is Eric uh, from South Sudan. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, mine, I would love to ask my colleague uh, in regards to when they, are, they were talking about selec selection criteria, looking at the vulnerability. I saw uh, child marriage, things to do with an accumbent children, it's the first priority of selection. Now my question is in regards to like if we have a child with more than one protection concern, especially for unaccompanied children, how do they make sure that uh, when they are maybe for instance make uh, putting these children in a foster family, is there an extra support uh, either to the foster parents so that they can continue like uh, the, the kind of business which they are giving to the children. And if it's so, and uh, looking at the time frame which he has said, looking at the WFP project and the other one, it seems that the time frame is too short to make sure that there is an impact which is uh, being realized at the end of the day. How do they make sure that this is uh, done and they get the result at the end of the day. Thank you. Yeah, as a, so first of all, like this, this, this matrix that uh, we present in terms of the, vulner the vulnerability criteria is for us to select, to tick all, the, all the, the needs of the child, the status of the household, and this give us a, a score we can use to transparently also uh, select the beneficiaries. And we use this also to present back to, for instance, with when I mentioned the, the project management committee um, within the WFP project. So, uh, of course, we consider the different aspects. And as I say, cash intervention alone is not, uh, you know, our objective. We know that we can't achieve um, child protection outcome by only uh, providing uh, financial support. So, as I say, it is important to have an integrated approach that can uh, bring additional additional services. Either depend on the donor you 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 are working with and their interest. You you might want to 
leverage from existing program you have, or you might advocate to get budget for, for additional services. Or if you are working in emergency response, you, you also need to link with uh, with other sector and other other partners who who, who you can work to with, together with to provide uh, the different services and respond to the different needs. As I say in my presentation, we use this mainly to to support the alternative care. When when we when we start to work in emergency for unaccompanied children. It's uh, something that we, we reckon as a useful um, contribution to ensure that alternative parent and the foster parent might, will give uh, the same attention, the same care that they might give for, to their biological kids. This is, in fact, to, to facilitate that level of contribution. So initially, when at the beginning, when we were trying to identify a pool of uh, standby foster, foster parent, we, we know that this is something that would also incentivize um, people to, to, to offer for, for support. And then again, uh, monitoring and, and uh, the child potential lens is, is very key because we don't want to have people who are just interested to, to have this opportunity without thinking about the, the, the child uh, well-being. In terms of the impact on the short term, I'm completely with you. And uh, we know that in development context, it's much easier to uh, to work on uh, creating strong evidence uh, over the over the years, but I think we also uh, child protection emergency as education emergency, we need to identify way to to bring some evidence, and uh, we can discuss on how reliable, how strong, how smart some of the indicator are. But we sh it shouldn't stop us to show that we are monitoring and we are measuring like uh, our our outcome on the on the child, uh, for instance, in this case on the child well-being. Similar question were given from, from another donor to us in our education emergency intervention where they were asking if it's uh, uh, useful or can we expect an impact on the learning outcome of the children when they go in a, in a, in a temporary learning center for six months. Maybe not, of course, it would be better to go in school for one or two years, but it doesn't, we still notice some of the, uh, for instance, impact in terms of, of learning outcome. And when I presented the expenditure, uh, the, the diversification of the expenditure, we saw some, some, some small increase that is still a positive result in terms of uh, investing on, uh, on medical expenses, on the, on the education of the, of the child. Maybe in a longer term, that the difference from end line, baseline and line would have been much more uh, important, for instance. So it's, it's a question for the, for the broader uh, community working in, in humanitarian. I think it's also important to, to advocate with donors to ensure that we don't only work with this short-term contract. Thank you, Marcello. Thanks a lot for attending the webinar and please do feel free to reach out to myself or Mirette from the Cash and Child Protection Task Force for anything else. Thank you and have a good day. Mm -hmm.